She's an anesthetist who has been practicing for the last 25 years now. Even more. <laughs> Even more than that. Uh, and uh, it's a great thing because she's with us because, you know, anesthetists use the drugs on a larger scale, especially the ones uh, which has to deal with anesthesia, of course, but also the emergency drugs uh, like adrenaline and so on. So it's a great value for, for us that she has agreed to be with us in the show and try to share her valuable knowledge with us. Uh, so I'm thankful to her that she has accepted my invitation to be with us and uh, uh, you know try to give us some insight into use of uh, many emergency drugs as such because there's very much of importance in clinical practice. Uh, so I welcome you ma'am again uh, to the show and uh, I think we'll start the session. Uh, the first thing I would like uh, the viewers to know is that why we need to know more about emergency drugs. Uh, there are various causes for that, uh, various reasons why we need to know and so on. So I'll, I'll just let uh, Dr. Susmita talk about uh, the use of these drugs and why we want to know them. So to Dr. Susmita. So as you know that clinicians, nurses, yeah. and medical staff yeah. and uh, you know the other staff yeah. who work in the medical discipline, they encounter emergencies of various frequencies. Various. Some in some emergencies are more, in some emergencies are less. Yes. However, some doctors like the emergency medicine doctors, yes. the intensivists, the anesthesiologists, yeah. they keep on using the emergency medicines on a more regular basis. Yes. But emergencies may happen <laughs> yeah, anywhere, 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 any anytime, time, yeah. to any speciality. Any specialties. Yeah. And an inability to manage these medical emergencies yeah. because of either inadequate knowledge yeah. of the emergency doses. Doses. The drugs also drugs, drugs yes. also to an extent. Yes. yes. And the dilutions yeah. may actually lead to ineffective, yeah. improper yeah. management and maybe sometimes tragic consequences. Tragic consequences. And that actually pulls the doctor to court of law especially. Exactly. exactly. So uh, we are aiming in this video yeah. to provide a very basic and working knowledge, working knowledge. basically a working knowledge of the pharmacology, the use, yeah. indications, contraindications sure. of emergency drugs, common emergency, common emergency drugs. Uh, so for today's session, we will be speaking about uh, drugs uh, which are used in emergencies as of adrenaline, uh, noradrenaline, dopamine, dobutamine and vasopressin. So these few drugs uh, in the session one of emergency medicine is that what we are going to talk. But before going up to the emergency drugs as such, uh, I would like to uh, just uh, tell them about adrenergic receptors because these are all of course vasopressor drugs. So they have an impact on a lot of systems of the body. So to start with, uh, these all drugs uh, have an impact on the adrenergic receptors. And adrenergic receptors uh, are the G-protein coupled receptors, the membrane bound receptors. Yes, now if the viewers are new to this, you can watch my videos on signal transduction on uh, uh, adrenergic receptors and so on. So get uh, full knowledge of how they act and so on. Uh, but anyway, just to highlight is that, that these receptors, adrenergic ones are the ones with the G-protein coupled receptors. And they primarily function by either increasing or decreasing the cyclic AMP that acts as the second messenger intracellularly. Some of these uh, receptors also operate, I mean there are a lot of uh, views on this, that some of, uh, I mean there are units to this G receptors which also have interplay uh, with the potassium or the calcium uh, channels directly. Uh, and the minor pathway is that they can also increase the prostaglandin production. So that's how they act in general. Now of course if you speak about specific receptor, then intracellularly some receptors might bring an increase in cyclic MP, some reduce cyclic MP, some may directly act on calcium or potassium ions uh, channels and so on, but that's the different story. Broadly speaking, these are the three ways in which these receptors act. Now, it has been classified these receptors into various classes, but the basic working classification is alpha receptor and a beta receptor. Alpha are the receptors which are classified again into alpha 1 and alpha 2. Alpha 1 are again post junctional receptors, alpha 1 are pre and post junctional. Uh, post junctional, I should say, are present in the brain and the pancreas and so on. 
alpha again are divided into subclasses like you know alpha 1a b and d and then 2 again into 2a b and c uh, anyway there are now specific drugs which can either inhibit or uh, are agonist at this sub receptor level also but we won't be talking much about that in this session so broadly speaking that's about alpha and about the beta receptors, uh, they are again classified as beta 1, 2, 3, beta 1 primarily in the heart and the kidneys, beta 2 in smooth muscles and the eyes, and beta 3 in the adipose tissue and the fat cells. So that's the basic classic uh, uh, where they are and that's the basic classification of these receptors. Uh, now again, if you are new to this, you can watch again my videos on these receptors so that to get more insight into this. Uh, so that was about receptors. Uh, the first drug that we are going to see today because that's all the session about the clinical pharmacology. So let's talk about adrenaline and who can be a better person than Dr. Susmita to just highlight the importance of adrenaline in medical practice as such. Thank you again. Yeah. So adrenaline or epinephrine yeah. as it is known and you have already rightly yeah. pro pointed out it's both uh, acts on the beta as well as the yeah. alpha receptors. But it acts on the beta receptors in the low doses. Low dose. And it's only in the higher dose yeah. that it acts on the alpha, alpha receptors. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, in this manner, I think dopamine is very similar, but, but uh, very similar. epinephrine is much more potent than much more potent, yeah. dopamine. Yeah. And uh, uh, in very low doses of 0 0.005 to 0 0.02 mics per kg yeah. per minute, yeah. it acts mainly on the beta receptors. Okay. As a result of uh, action on the beta receptors, you oh. know that the heart contractility increases yeah. as well as the heart rate increases. Heart rate increases. Uh, the blood pressure does not change much uh -huh. because at these doses, yeah. uh, it's only the beta receptors, beta that, receptors that, that are activated. That are activated. Yeah. In higher doses, of yeah. course, the alpha receptors are activated. Yes. And uh, uh, this may lead to even uh, you know renal vasoconstriction. Renal vasoconstriction. And uh, uh, because of the renal vasoconstrictions, this may be a sort of you know a, a cutoff point for our adrenaline therapy in a yeah. patient. Yeah. Doses higher than 0.1 microgram per kg per minute mm -hmm. produces severe vasoconstriction mm -hmm. uh, because of the alpha effects, along with the beta effects of increased heart rate and okay. yeah. Yeah. Uh, So the vasoconstriction it happens at both the arterial as well as the venous levels okay. and along with this mm -hmm. what we find is that lower lower doses uh -huh. uh, we are talking about the beta effects beta now. effects now. Vasodilatation happens in the muscle and the liver vasculature yes but at higher doses there is vasoconstriction yeah so in low doses or moderate doses the overall cardiac effects of epinephrine would be an increase in the cardiac output, yes. a redistribution of the cardiac output to muscular and hepatic circulation, yes. and very little change in the blood pressure. Yes. Yeah. And although the cardiac output is increased, increased yeah. the blood pressure does not change yeah. much because here the systemic res resistance falls yeah. because of the beta 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 beta. receptor yeah. activation. Yeah. But at higher concentration, yeah. epinephrine definitely yeah. does increase the blood pressure yeah. because then it binds to the alpha and alpha receptors of the blood vessels yeah. and this offsets the beta 2 receptor mediated vasodilatation. Yeah. Because it's an interplay between the alpha and the beta that brings about this kind of effect. Now this can be very well seen in the graph uh, which yeah. you can see now actually. Now this kind of a graph of course is a kind of animal experiment that is always done to demonstrate uh, the, the presence of alpha and beta on the dog's blood pressure. But anyway, those can again be extrapolated to human effects on blood pressure right, even. So in this graph what uh, now you can see is that uh, the EPI stands for epinephrine or adrenaline. Uh, so it gives kind of a, if the, you see the blue line here, right. uh, the blue line is what is the, uh, what is the blood pressure effect. Uh, of, uh, I should say, the, uh, the adrenaline. So it causes a biphasic kind of a response as you can see here. So when the blood pressure goes up and then comes down. So when you give adrenaline, inject adrenaline, it's at high dose in the body. So what happens is that alpha are the ones which get activated, so vasoconstriction occurs. But as the levels of adrenaline go down, because as you know, adrenaline is destroyed by uh, monoamine oxidase and COMP. So it, it's going and there's a lot of interplay between these uh, degrading enzymes right. also. 
So once it starts degrading, the levels fall down, then what activates is the beta receptor. So you see the fall. So that biphasic response is the one that uh, is very much seen with kind of especially animal experimentation. Now how much that you can extrapolate in uh, human, human beings is definitely a different criteria. But something of this sort is what happens even with the blood pressures in uh, human beings. Now what you can see also from this curve is that, uh, now this is the PHEN that stands here is actually alpha blocker which is given. So you block the alpha receptors, you give epinephrine and then you again give alpha blocker. You are trying to block the alpha receptors. So now don't expect any kind of a vasoconstriction. Now once again if you give epinephrine, which you can see here the third time where the epinephrine is given, now what you can see is only a downtrend. So you don't see an uptrend, you just see the beta getting activated, that's causing a slight decrease in the blood dilatation, blood pressure decreases. Now this is a very typical of Dale's phenomena that we call that, that demonstrates that there is alpha and beta receptors which are present. So that's a very classical way how they explain in pharmacology the effects of adrenaline, and existence of receptors uh, and so on. So that was a quick look into this uh, very basics of how adrenaline acts especially in the experimental pharmacology that totally relates to what she said now about uh, of course uh, what happens in human beings. So uh, if that was it about adrenaline, the next is about dilutions of adrenaline because already said there are a lot of things about how adrenaline should be used in clinical practice. The basic dilemma is I mean, the root of administration, dilutions, doses and so on. So Dr. Susmita, something on dilutions of adrenaline. Right. Yeah. Uh, actually adrenaline is a very potent drug as yeah. all of us know. It is available as uh, ampules, yeah. in, uh, commonly as one milligram per milliliter ampules, mm. and also larger vials, 30 mm. ml vials. Yeah. It is available as auto injectors, okay. especially uh, which are pres prescribed for personal use in patients who suffer from anaphylactic yeah. reactions commonly. Yeah. Yeah. And it is also available in dilute concentrations. You know, yeah. sometimes you need to give bolus doses. Uh -huh. So uh, it's available in vials in dilute concentration. Yeah. Now the common concentration that's available in ampules is one in one thousand. Yeah. So if it is in vials in dilute concentrations or pre-filled syringes, yeah. the dilution is ten times. So it is available as one in ten thousand solutions. Yeah. It is uh, as, uh, something we must remember is that it is incompatible with sodium bicarbonate. Yeah. Because these all drugs go hand in hand yes, when you are treating an emergency. Yeah. Right, right. And uh, but they are uh, compatible with dopamine and dovitamine. You know, yeah. other drugs. Uh, other, which are other drugs used which along, are along with it. Along with it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, just comes to my mind that there is something to be more on adrenaline as far as physiological impacts are concerned. Uh, so again to Dr. Susmita, I think we just talked about uh, effects on cardiovascular uh, system but of course adrenaline has so many other uh, effects because as you, as I just mentioned the receptors alpha, beta spread across the body. Uh, so something we missed out but I think uh, now we remember that we need to speak to you about that. So uh, to you. Yeah, okay. yeah, since we are talking about uh, you know the use yeah. of auto injectors, I yeah. think we should mention over here at this point of time that epinephrine has got an anti-inflammatory effect as, yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, it blocks the release of inflammatory mediators from the muscles yeah. and the basophils yeah. and in response to any antigenic challenge. Yes. And therefore, adrenaline is used in, in anaphylaxis. It's the main it is, it's state, it's state, it's the main state of treatment. treatment yeah. right? And apart from that, we should not forget, I think, the metabolic effects of adrenaline. Metabolic, yeah. uh, in a normal individual, maybe the metabolic effects do not make a lot of difference. Yeah. But in a critically ill patient, I think we must remember this. It, it has several effects like it may produce a hypermetabolism. Yeah. It can cause hyperglycemia. Yeah. It increases the level of circulating keto acids. Yeah. And there might be increase of Lactic levels. lactic levels and therefore it's commonly a patient who's on adrenaline therapy for a longer time yeah. needs serum lactate estimation. Serum lactate estimation. Potassium levels may decline uh -huh. and uh, usually uh, they are declining the level of less than 1 milli equivalents per liter okay. but again on long term therapy with adrenaline I think okay. this is something. This is possible. something but not on a short term basis. On a short term basis I don't think, I don't think this, think. this affects um, show up.
Yeah. But again, in critically ill patients who are uh, on adrenaline therapy for a longer time, yeah, we, 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 must we, we must do a potassium levels for the patient. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, then, the, then we come to uses of adrenaline because we all the way talked about uh, anaphylaxis, but there are several other uses of adrenaline. But we need to know many more things how adrenaline is used, dilutions, route of administration, and so on. So the first use of adrenaline is of course in anaphylaxis and since we are dealing with clinical pharmacology of course drugs are the mainstay why people get anaphylaxis and one of the reasons is take administration of drugs. So we are at the right point, we are describing adrenaline for anaphylaxis. Uh, so to know Dr. Susmita about adrenaline in anaphylaxis. In anaphylaxis, adrenaline is used intramuscularly yeah. in doses of 300 to 500 micrograms. Okay. And this indicates that if we have a 1 milligram per milliliter ampule, okay. 0.3 to 0.5 ml of the 1 in 1000 solution okay. is to be used in intramuscularly. It can be given and repeated twice uh -huh. at 20 minutes interval okay. if the clinical you know, improvement well, does not occur does not, yeah. until 3 doses are given. Uh, patients uh, who have major airway compromise or severe hypotension mm -hmm. because of yeah, because that that's the sequence of anaphylaxis yeah. may be given intramuscular epinephrine uh -huh. uh, may delay the onset of action. Okay. In such cases, it's wise to give adrenaline uh, ten times diluted. That means now we use a three to five ml of one in ten thousand solution. Okay. Uh, diluted with diluted no, yeah with 10 ml of yeah. normal saline uh -huh. and this is used I think intravenously if our line is available I if, line, if your IV line is available available yeah if not adrenaline can also be given through the end tube yeah okay. and uh, patients who require multiple doses of adrenaline it's better to give IV adrenaline as infusions as infusions. So the mainstay is that you give adrenaline by intramuscular group yeah. in the normal dilutions that you mentioned. But if you want to have a patient being given IV, then you require dilutions of adrenaline, a more diluted adrenaline. But of course, the scenario should demand that. So maybe a lot of airway compromise, hypotension, and so on. So maybe a late cases of anaphylaxis patients, severe cases, severe cases ah. then you might require even IV uh, adrenaline in that case. Exactly. exactly. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, and I would I would like at this point to comment on adrenaline doses for anaphylaxis in the children too. Yeah. Uh, beyond 12 years of age, provided the child is well built, mm -hmm. uh, 500 mics or 0.5 milliliter, as used in adults, okay. can still be used. Can still be used. Yes. Okay. But yeah, we always treat you know the pediatric age group is crucial. Say it's crucial, you know, whom to treat as an adult and whom to treat as a pediatric. Of so, uh, but if the child is small built or pre-puberty, we yeah. slightly lower the dose and use 300 mics or around 0.3 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. ml of the 1 in 1000 solution. Okay. Uh, between 6 to 12 years, mm -hmm. commonly 300 micrograms are used okay. intramuscularly. And uh, 6 months to 6 years, the dose is it's half. still half that. Half, half yeah. of yeah. 300. Yeah. So, it is 150 micrograms. Yeah. And in small children also, it it is uh, it has not no clinical trials as such have been done, but uh, commonly 150 micrograms are again uh, used in. But you still situations. recommend the intramuscular injection? Here? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So even in children, that goes as intramuscular. Yeah, in children, uh, veins are very difficult. veins are very difficult to get, of course. Yeah, yeah. And of course, that's an emergency, so you exactly, cannot wait. Exactly. Uh, but of course, subcute adrenaline is not to be used. Not, not to be. Not, not to be, because that's a peripheral vasoconstriction. So yes, yes. please try to. Absorption of adrenaline. Absorption is not really delayed, of course. Yeah. And that much time may not be with us to exactly. save the patient's life. So exactly. this is something that, that's an intramuscular route that we use for adrenaline. Of course, we use something more on adrenaline. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so um, at this point, I would like to mention yeah. that uh, if IV adrenaline is required to be given as infusions, or as bolus doses, okay. um, we must ensure that there is adequate monitoring of the patient. Mm -hmm. The minimum dose that can be recommended mm -hmm. as bolus mm -hmm. is 50 micrograms. Okay. And usually we have uh, pre-filled syringes are available mm -hmm. of 1 in 10,000 solutions. 
Okay. So that each ML actually contains 100 mics. 100 mics, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if we want to give 50 mics, mm. that means we have to give 0.5 ML of yeah. the solution. 0.5, yes. That is the smallest, smallest dose, dose. Yeah. that can be given. And uh, as a bolus, it's not recommended that the undiluted, undiluted dose is, is given. Yeah. Especially one in 10, one in 1,000 is not. So uh, this is about the IV bolus dose. Yes. And uh, the way we do it is we give the bolus, see the effects, filtrate, okay. and give further bolus Feel. or do not give. Yeah, depending upon how the recovery the, is there. The, or no. uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, however, it is always better to use an infusion yes. because then we get a steady state plasma steady state level. Plasma level is important. That's very important. <laughs> so an infusion uh, is then titrated according to the hemodynamic okay. response that is available. Yes. And for infusions, there are recommended guidelines available in standard yes. textbooks. Yeah. But even individual hospitals and individual uh, you know, practice, yes. you have different sort of guidelines. Different. Because that's upon the experience of an individual, how many yes. patients yes, treated with IV adrenaline and so on, yes. all it makes a difference. Yeah. Yeah. So we recommended both textbook as well as local guidelines for the preparation and infusion of But of course that should be diluted amount. It cannot yes. be something which is it diluted. Be, uh, yeah. Diluted. Yeah. And uh, it is preferably done under specialist cover. Yeah, that is that is the important. recommendations yeah. of a specialist. There should be in patient and then only you start up the patient. But so for anaphylaxis, uh, the max is that uh, a general practitioner can give uh, intramuscular dose. Yeah. Uh, or at the max what he can do a diluted once with adrenaline but he of course requires a specialist attention over a period of time so the patient can be managed very well yeah and monitoring but monitoring of course monitoring is of course very much into that yeah so and and the other way you have it is as auto injectors auto -injector. now auto injectors are uh, recommended for patient use mm -hmm. um, if, if they are intelligent enough to use <laughs> intelligent enough to use and um, the two common doses of uh, auto injectors that are available are in the form of 0 0.15 yeah. for the pediatric age group uh -huh. and 0 0.3 milligrams for the adults. For the adult. So common recommendation for the adults is Point. that uh, 0.3 is the minimum. Yeah. So the, the patient should be at least carrying two auto injectors because the dose varies from 300 to 500 micrograms. And uh, for the practitioner also, if Auto injector is the only form available at that moment. Yeah. He, he, no, has to he, he has to In fact, this is one of the best yeah. things he can also do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Rather than look that for look for the everything. preparation yeah. or the IM other preparation. If he has an auto injector, better to take that yeah. uh, and the diagram. Uh, yeah, this is a, this explains it's a self-explanatory um, information about how uh, uh, auto injectors auto -injector. are used, huh. and they can be actually used with. The, it's not necessary for the patient to remove the clothing. And uh, the common place for injection is usually the outer thigh, okay. and uh, it can be given either by yourself uh, or, or by the practitioner. Yeah. And uh, after the injection is given, uh, the area is to be massaged for a period of time, so that the drug gets yes. into the body. And so yes. yeah. Yes. So that was a very insightful thing, insightful. Uh, I mean, I should say, a review on an adrenaline in anaphylaxis, extensive one. But as you know, adrenaline is a very important drug, so uses don't end here. The next is use is going to be of adrenaline in cardiac arrest. So something like that. Adrenaline yes, cardiac of course. Yeah. Cardiac arrest uh, management, of course, uh, cannot be yeah. without adrenaline, especially in patients with pulseless arrest, pulseless. like in uh, patients with pulseless electrical activity or basis stroke. So, so uh, even in patients in whom uh, shock has been given for ventricle fibrillation, yeah. if the patient is non-shockable, yeah. then adrenaline is recommended. Is the dose recommended, uh, and this is the recent guidelines yeah. obtained from 2010 uh, American Heart Association, the dose is one milligram given every five minutes mm -hmm. and repeated every three to, three five, to five, five minutes on, depending on the response. Yeah. And uh, adrenaline is also recommended as a post-cardiac arrest algorithm. Yeah. And that is uh, in form of infusions, uh, 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 microgram per kg per minute. So, 
I think that's the algorithm that we are talking yes, about. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So of course the other things are going to be there on CP, the general management of airway breathing and circulation, but that adrenaline has a role to play as uh, Dr. Susmita said that you need to give it in particular scenarios and I think this is what uh, uh, the algorithm which talks about, not just about adrenaline but of course all about how to manage a cardiac arrest in acute condition. Yes. Uh, so if that's okay then uh, we move to the next use of adrenaline is in shock state. Yes. Uh, so something on shock. Uh, Actually, epinephrine is uh, not recommended as the yeah. first line management first. in sh yeah. shock. Yeah. Uh, as we know, if, it, if the shock is due to hemorrhage or hypovolemia, yeah. the recommendation is to uh, infusion, infusion of volumes, volumes of, uh, yeah. um, of crystalloids yeah. or colloids, yeah. um, uh, whatever may be uh, the, 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 need. the need at that hour. And, uh, but if hypertension persists in spite of adequate volume replacement uh -huh. in such situations, then uh, commonly dopamine or norepinephrine is used. Mm -hmm. But epinephrine may be added uh -huh. to either of them yes. if adequate response has not been obtained. Okay. So uh, that's where adrenaline stops as far as shock is concerned. Mm -hmm. But but then again we have classification of shock. So Right. Yeah, low right. output and uh, high output, so nothing on that. Okay, okay. So, um, uh, the initial information that I gave was on shock, that is hypovolemic shock. Yeah. Now, when we come to other kinds of shocks, yeah. especially obstructive shocks, yes. which produce low output, low output. Uh, we have uh, common the cardiac tamponade right. and pulmonary embolism, embolism yeah. as common causes of obstructive shock. Yeah. And here, uh, epinephrine or adrenaline can be used for anotropic support Yes. and uh, this is indicated to maintain the tissue perfusion yes. until a definitive therapy of either pericardiosynthesis for yeah. tamponade or thrombolytic therapy for embolism for has embolism. been initiated. Right. Yeah. right. And in pulmonary embolism again, uh, the expansion of the circulatory volume should be combined yeah. with the anotropic agent. Yeah. Because we need to uh, need to uh, maintain the systemic blood pressure yeah. and thus preserve the right ventricular yeah. perfusion. perfusion. Uh, because the uh, uh, right ventricular pressures are usually raised, raised here. Yeah. So in order to maintain the perfusion, we either use an okay. or not can also yeah. be used. Uh, in high output states, yeah. for example, in sepsis, yeah. where there is a lot of vasodilatation, yeah. adrenaline is. Um, a cheap and effective way, yeah. but uh, commonly it is not used because of the increase in the lactate levels yes. and aggravation of splanchnic yeah. ischemia. Yeah. Uh, here again, here again, the drug of choice so is not adrenaline. Not adrenaline. Okay. The third use of adrenaline is in bradycardia. Okay. Yes, in bradycardia. Yeah. Actually, atropine is atropine the is first, the first, first, first drug of choice. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yes. But uh, if there's no response to atropine. Then, as a second line of uh, treatment, yeah. atropine uh, may be given. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. adrenaline can be given in doses of 2 to 10 microgram per minute. Yeah. And this is the adult dose. This is adult dose. Yeah. Of course, there will be uh, limitations of how much you use it in pediatric, but that's again a uh, very specialist talk. Yeah. So, we'll be going into that. Uh, of course, adrenaline has a role to play in asthma and airway obstruction. Of course, for asthma, now we have so many other good drugs. So, adrenaline, of course, may not be the first choice, but that it has a role to play. Uh, so something on that. Yeah, definitely. Adrenaline is a uh, uh, bronchodilator. Bronchodilator. And uh, it is be used, however, either specific beta-2 agonists are yeah. not available, yeah. or the patient is not responding to those drugs. Yeah. In special circumstances, adrenaline has been used um, intramuscularly in doses of 300 to 500 micrograms. Yeah. Um, another use in uh, of adrenaline, mm -hmm. uh, especially uh, commonly used by the anesthesiologist, yeah. is a racemic mixture of adrenaline, one mm -hmm. milligram in five ml of uh, normal saline, okay. and then nebulized. Okay. It has been used very successfully mm -hmm. in treating children with upper airway obstruction due to crew, uh -huh. and it has been also used successfully in post intubation edema. Okay. Yeah, it has been used, yeah. and. Um, uh, it has been found that use of uh, adrenaline in these circumstances mm -hmm. is accompanied by immediate benefits yeah. and uh, 
know cardiovascular disease. Yeah, because I was aware about this use, but yeah. I haven't used the adrenaline in this form. So something which is very new, even to me at this point, about the use of adrenaline as per the root of administration is concerned on adrenaline. Okay, uh, so adrenaline again has so many other uses. You know, adrenaline is used along with local anesthesia so that the time they act becomes more. Uh, adrenaline is also used by dental um, uh, practitioners in the form of uh, dilutions where they keep it so that they can uh, cut it down on the blood loss after a tooth, uh, tooth removal and so on. So these are all the use of adrenaline but anyway those are not the ones which are for emergency purposes. So we just keep all those uses uh, for the discussions that we will do when we will be doing sessions on anesthesia or drugs for uh, you know, kind of dental issues and so on. So I won't talk about much about them and now. Uh, so I mean extensively done uses of adrenaline uh, with all the dilutions, route of administration, when to be given and how to be given. Uh, the few adverse drug reactions of adrenaline, no drug is, exists that has no side effects. So adrenaline also has a side effect and adrenaline acts on so many receptors which are spread across the body. So there are going to be uh, side effects of adrenaline. Adrenaline call, I mean, is the reason that people can get arrhythmias. In fact, there are fatal cases uh, where people have died after giving adrenaline because of uh, induction of arrhythmia. So that becomes a limitation uh, to the use of adrenaline. And uh, arrhythmias can also be triggered uh, when they use by, by use of certain other anesthetic drugs like halothin or any other electrolyte imbalances which can trigger up and can expand the potential of adrenaline to cause arrhythmias. Uh, coronary ischemia can also occur and is not related to the dose, uh, but uh, there are cases where people have suffered because of coronary ischemia. Uh, renal vasoconstriction is prominent with adrenaline, uh, but ischemic renal failure, uh, I mean we see that to an extent, uh, but with very high doses. Usually accidental accident. doses. But that we should exceed too much of a yeah. dose than, yeah. uh, but otherwise should not be an issue. Uh, epinephrine can cause, adrenaline can cause a serious hypertension patients receiving beta receptor uh, antagonists and effect attributed to unopposed alpha action. So that is one important drug interaction of adrenaline. Should be uh, careful. Should be very careful. Getting beta blockers. Very beta fact. blockers in fact. Uh, a few contraindications to use of adrenaline is that uh, it should not be used in people who are potentially uh, liable to get arrhythmias or when you are using it with halothin, uh, which sensitizes heart to a lot of arrhythmias. Uh, it should be cautiously used in people who are elderly with hypertension, who are hyperthyroid, because the chances of them getting cardiac issues, arrhythmias, very high blood pressures are common. If at all you want to give adrenaline, prefer to give it by central line because the monitoring becomes much more uh, I mean, proper in that way. Uh, as Dr. Susmira said, a few laboratory tests may be, need to, may be required for patients. So lactic levels can be measured. Getting in patients getting infusions, yeah, infusions of adrenaline. Of adrenaline. Yeah. Uh, and as far as drug interactions, especially with ICUs, then maybe one needs to be very careful when you are using it with MAO inhibitors or tricyclic antidepressants because these agents uh, have a role to play. I mean, they can increase uh, the toxic effects of adrenaline. If you are using a MAO inhibitor, that definitely adrenaline is not going to get metabolized. So the levels will increase, cause a lot of problems. So you need to be aware when you are using with antidepressants like uh, MAO inhibitors or even antidepressants, respiratory tricyclic That's antidepressants. Right. antidepressants. Uh, so that was about adrenaline uh, throughout on uses, administration, and about uh, you know uh, side effects of adrenaline, contraindications and so on. The next drug is going to pass the ball to Dr. Smita to talk about noradrenaline now, which again is an important emergency medicine uh, next to I think say adrenaline mm -hmm. as far as a lot of emergencies are concerned. Do you the noradrenaline is another important vasopressor, as you rightly pointed out, yeah. Amaya. And uh, it differs from adrenaline in certain respects because it has a more prominent alpha receptor action mm -hmm. as compared to the beta. Yeah, so, so the, the receptor level is changing. changing. Even we are talking of same neurotransmitters, adrenergic drugs, but adrenaline has actions on a lot of other things, but noradrenaline predominantly has alpha action. Alpha action. Yeah. As a result of which yeah. it produces. Vasoconstriction, yes. vasoconstriction. Yes. A 
but being a beta 1 receptor stimulant as well, yeah. it does produce an anotropic action yeah. as well as a, it's a director of the coronary arteries. Yes. Now, norepinephrine yeah. contains uh, bisulfite of sodium. Yeah, so it's a, it's a, I should say, a salt? It's a salt. Yeah. And this sulfite is important yeah. because it can cause uh, allergic reactions. Even anaphylaxis. Even an anaphylaxis. So in the fact, injection itself can produce anaphylactic reactions. Exactly, reaction. exactly. Yeah. And it has been noted to more in asthmatics as compared to non asthmatics. So one should be aware of the mm -hmm. drug itself because of the content can cause anaphylactic reaction. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, another thing is, uh, as for adenine, uh -huh. noradenine again is not indicated in patients which, who have primary hypovolemia. Yeah. And uh, it can only be given in certain circumstances. For example, um, uh, we are waiting, uh, there's an emergency, yeah. the uh, replacement of fluids of blood is unable to maintain the coronary or the cerebral perfusion. Yeah. So in order to maintain coronary and cerebral perfusion, uh, until a proper amount of blood uh, is available for replacement, oh. we can use more Yeah, uh, That points out to the graph which you are seeing there now to the screen. That's about the serious effects of noradrenaline. Mm -hmm. Again, the blue line indicates, as we have seen with adrenaline, this indicates uh, the blood pressure. So you can see an upward surge in the blood pressure after giving noradrenaline that is mentioned as NEPI down mm -hmm. here. So this surge of noradrenaline is basically the alpha action that we are talking of. So predominantly alpha action, uh, I should say no or very minimal beta action. So it's not uh, targeted into the clinical scenarios most of the time. So that's how noradrenaline has an impact on the blood pressure. Uh, to you, Doctor, uh, to Doctor Spurgeon, again on noradrenaline uses and doses. Yeah. yeah. Uh, noradrenaline is uh, a potent vasoconstrictor. Yes. Therefore. It is used in vasodilatory shocks, yes. particularly septic shock and neurogenic shock. Neurogenic. As we know, in both these kind of shocks, there is peripheral vasodilatory shock compared to vasoconstriction in other varieties of yes. shock. In septic shock, the beta 1 effect may also improve the myocardial function yes. because there might be dysfunction of the myocardial seen with sepsis and septic shock. Yes. So, in these two conditions, not ordinary. Considered, it's considered useful. Yeah. Again, it's intravenously given, uh -huh. and uh, all these drugs, vasopressors, yeah. be it adrenaline or not adrenaline, yeah. they have very short durations of action. Yes. And uh, commonly, not adrenaline is available in antiots or vials, uh -huh. and uh, it is available in premixed bags as well. Okay. So we can get a solution of not adrenaline. Mm -hmm. Uh, a 100 ml bag may contain 10 mg of noradrenaline. So easy to administer. Uh, yes, by kind of infusion. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the doses are usually 0 to 20 ml per hour. Okay. And uh, it is compatible with 5% dextrose yeah. as well as with sodium chloride. Okay. And that can be stored. Can the room temperature. Room temperature. Okay. Uh, the next is about infusions of noradrenaline because we already have the doses. So infusions of noradrenaline? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, Infusion pumps, I should say, because you said that you know these drugs need to be given carefully, IV and so on. So monitoring is required. Yes. Drop to drop titration of drugs is required. So then, in that scenario, we have so many other ways of delivering drugs. So infusion pumps, syringes, and so on. Something of these things, because this is something very new and very clinical, core clinical, I should say, when you want to administer drugs and monitor the effects on to minute to minute basis. Yeah. Right. So infusions can be given by microdrip chambers yes, as well, microdrip. but microdrip infusion sets, they are only to be used if infusion pumps or syringe drivers are not available. Yeah. Uh, because both the infusion pumps and the syringe drivers, they allow the medications to be given more accurately. More accurately. As compared to as a, mi a microdrip micro infusion yeah. set. And uh, um, as you know that half-life of NORAD is only 2.5 minutes. Yeah. And therefore, it is required to be given by an infusion pump because yeah. by the time the action starts, the the duration of the action is already. So you need to yeah. be very careful on these things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So with syringe drivers, uh, I think something on syringe drivers. Yeah, basically, syringe driver is uh, nothing but you know the, they are uh, equipment 
yeah. which can drive syringes of yeah. different sizes. Okay. Uh, commonly, a 50 ml syringe is used mm -hmm. for infusions of noradrenaline. Okay. Uh, common solutions that are made are 4 milligrams, which is uh, diluted with 50 ml of dextrose, 5% okay. dextrose. Okay. And uh, this is done so that one ml mm -hmm. uh, contains around one microgram, one microgram. of uh, the solution. Yeah. And uh, the infusions, as I've already mentioned earlier, is uh, 1 to 20 microgram per minute. Yeah. So you can start with 1 microgram per minute, which yeah. is around 0.8 Eight to 8 1 ml. ml. Yeah. ML per so I mean, the less quantities of drugs are required. So yeah. that's the reason that we require that accuracy. Accuracy. And these things with syringe drivers or infusion pumps provide the accuracy, yeah. less monitoring as far as administration of drugs are concerned, yeah. at least. So, uh, what you see, see in the slide is one way you can get the infusion, yeah. but of course, the local hospital guidelines. Uh, there will be differ. local guidelines, yeah. but this can be treated as one of the ways in which that uh, yeah. drug is given as far as syringe drivers are concerned. Yeah. The next is about infusion pumps, okay. Uh, one more way. Anyway, uh, this, uh, your, I mean, your video shows those pictures of syringe drivers, infusion pumps. So, but if you want to have better working knowledge, it's better to visit a ICU or MIC where you can see these things working on. So that's the best way you can learn. Yeah, I think. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. The infusion pump, something on that. And the like infusion pumps again yeah. work on the similar, similar principles, guide, principles where you give uh, very accurate, accurate dose infusions. Yeah. Here the noradrenaline is diluted in a 500 ml bottle commonly yeah. so that you have a 10 times more dilution of the drug yeah. and automatically the doses uh, in ml will be 10 times more. 10 times more. Where uh, you gave 0.8 ml per hour, yeah. here 1 microgram per minute would be equivalent to 8 ml per eight. hour. So that's the way I mean. Again, yeah. uh, these are all practical stuff so you want to have practical knowledge of these things better to visit a ward. And check up the local guidelines, the check hospital the, guidelines. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And if you ask me, the best way would be ask to learn, uh, to, to learn it from a healthcare work. professional, uh, preferably work. after hours to get with some anesthesia resident or probably even the head yes. nurse and intensivist. These are the people who work with this kind of things on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So they will be able to guide you on that. Uh, but anyway, that's the, roughly how these things uh, uh, are given. So, uh, noradrenaline also has side effects. So, can you just look at the side effects of noradrenaline? Uh, being a potent vasoconstrictor, yeah. it may lead to ischemic injuries to the tissues. Yeah. Principally, the pulmonary, renal, and the mesenteric uh, circulations may suffer because of the vasoconstriction. Yes. Therefore, it's very important to uh, always monitor the function of this system yeah. when norad is given as infusion. Yeah. On the cardiovascular system, yeah. as uh, against uh, tachycardia seen with uh, adrenaline. Yeah, we see bradycardia. We see yeah, that we have appreciated when we saw the graph also. The yes. red line goes down. Yes. Yeah. So there's a bradycardia and uh, it may also lead to anxiety and transient headaches uh -huh. uh, with long term infusion of noradrenaline. Yeah. But there are a few limitations also to use of noradrenaline. Uh, actually, um, it is no longer considered the first line drug for management of circulatory shock as we've seen. Yeah. Um, uh, the reports of renal failure have come in and therefore um, the, uh, the tissue vasoconstriction mm. limits the use of uh, NORAD. Okay. Uh, in case of hypotension which is refractory to uh, dopamine, mm. it can be used yeah. and added as second added agent. Added as a second line agent. As an agent. Mm. However, the interest and the use of not at lies mm. with septic shock. Septic. Yeah. Because uh, it has been found that there is less vasoconstriction mm. and improved organ Audio perfusion, perfusion mm. in response to noradrenaline. As per septic shock is yeah. concerned. Yeah. Yeah. So that was about noradrenaline, uh, again an important drug I should say as far as emergency medicine is concerned. The next in the line is going to be on uh, dopamine. Dopamine. Uh, uh, is uh, the next drug in line. So again, a drug which is used, uh, where, I mean, by most of the specialty, I should say, yeah. uh, very commonly used. Very commonly used drug, not just into, I should say, uh, intensive care units, but also outside the intensive care units. Uh, also, we use dopamine in wards also for uh, 
so many other reasons. Anyway, we'll come to those things. So dopamine is uh, again uh, it acts on its own receptors D1 and D2, but also it's an adrenergic agonist um, agent. Uh, dopamine one receptors uh, are the ones which are situated on the renal and the mesenteric blood vessels, and they are the ones which are the most sensitive to dopamine. Uh, infusions of dopamine dilates these vessels by increasing uh, the cyclic AMP intracellularly. Again, need to look back into uh, where they act, how they act. Uh, need to watch those videos on signal transduction and see uh, the interactions with cyclic AMP and so on. On a macroscopic level, they increase uh, the globulation filtration rate and sodium excretion by the kidneys. But moderately high doses of dopamine produces positive iotrophic effect by direct action on the beta-1 uh, receptors as well as the combined ones with the dopamine action. Vasoconstriction which is predominantly uh, mediated by the alpha-1 action occurs when large doses are infused of dopamine. Uh, on an overall basis, dopamine increases cardiac output and systolic blood pressure uh, but it's important that it does not penetrate the blood brain barrier so uh, the CNS effects of dopamine are very less. As far as kinetics of dopamine is concerned, that action starts within 5 minutes, uh, has a half-life of around 1 to 2 minutes. It's rapidly metabolized by MAO and COMT. Again, um, the, it's adrenergic, uh, um, I should say, uh, transmitter. So remember that uh, degrading enzymes are going to remain the same. And dopamine usually requires an infusion to the given. So if that was on pharmacology, uh, Dr. Susmita will be talking of the uses, uh, limitations of dopamine and the current clinical status of where it is used and so on. So to you. As you rightly pointed out, Dr. Amaya, that dopamine is a very commonly used vasopressor. Yeah. And uh, it is used in wards as well as yeah. in the ICU. Dopamine and or dopamine or at nor actually. Nor. They are recommended in patients with uh, acute heart failure, uh -huh. especially when the blood pressure is below 85 millimeter of mercury. Yes. So uh, usually conventionally dopamine is started. Yeah. And uh, patients with hypertension mm. due to uh, hemorrhage, mm. um, again, mm. uh, it's not recommended that you start dopamine first and then give fluids. Okay. Always we must start with the fluids, fluids and then go and on then to the blisters. Just to maintain the blood pressure yeah. above a mean of 60 millimeter of mercury, yeah. we must uh, infuse some vasopressor. Mm. And the primary option again remains dopamine yeah. in doses of 20, around 5 to 20 microgram okay. per kg per minute. Okay. Uh, it is also recommended in neurogenic shock, though primarily uh, we said that noradrenaline is the okay. drug of choice. And it, dopamine, along with uh, adrenaline, mm is uh, also the second drug of choice drug for of choice for So either we first use atropine, but if not adrenaline, dopamine, dopamine, so we just go on with the other yeah. trans Symptomatic Symptomatic, yeah, symptomatic yeah. 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 Uh, Dopamine, however, yeah. should be used with caution. Uh -huh. And uh, I must stress the importance of correction of hypovolemia, hypoxia, any high carbon dioxide levels and acidosis before yeah. dopamine is started. Yes. Uh, one uh, particular thing which must be remembered that dopamine is uh, to be used in a large vein yeah. because extravasation has been noted to produce necrosis, necrosis and sloughing of the yeah. surrounding tissues. Yeah. Uh, as for the other vasopressors, monitoring of the hemodynamics, particularly blood pressure, the urine output, and when possible cardiac output yeah. and the pulmonary capillary which pressure should be monitored. Monitor. Dopamine is to be used with caution in patients with occlusive vascular disease like Raynaud's or patients with atherosclerosis or with Burgess disease. Mm. Uh, particularly, it must be noted whether there are any color changes or temperature changes in the limbs mm. because again, it may, might produce uh, slapping of so, the yeah. tissues. Patients with uh, tricyclic antidepressants mm. and monoamine oxidase yeah. inhibitors again yeah, so I mean, that's, uh, uh, that's, that's a precaution like, across yeah. when you're using any kind of sympathomimetic drugs. Yeah, either start with low doses yeah. or use another agent. Use another agent. Yeah. Or stop these agents. Right? Stop, these stop, these stop agents. and then you start on with the drugs. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, it also contains sodium metabisulfide. Yeah. yeah. So, so that can itself give rise to an Exactly. Yeah. Hyper, yeah. So something which was common to a noradrenaline is very much common to a dopamine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, one important thing that uh, we must remember that though dopamine improves the urinary output, yeah. uh, it has been not seen to improve the outcomes in okay. acute renal failure. Uh -huh. So low dose dopamine for renal protection is no longer recommended. And uh, as a vasopressor again, mm. uh, it, the action of dopamine is now being questioned, mm. particularly because of uh, its uh, side effects and increased rate of uh, mortality, yeah. especially in patients with septic shock. But it is still a common drug which is used because yeah, most of many, the many of us are more familiar with it. We have used dopamine so much. Yeah. That we are all familiar with dopamine as an agent. Yes, we are comfortable. We are comfortable with it. Yeah. Yes, so it becomes a part of a routine, routine treatment. treatment. Yeah. Right. yeah. So that was an insightful uh, I mean, uh, talk on dopamine. Uh, the next in the line is, of course, dobutamine. Okay. One more drug uh, again. Now remember that dobutamine, again, uh, very much like dopamine, I should say. It's not a precursor of dopamine or something of that sort, but has action on alpha and beta receptors. But the action is more specific for the beta receptor. So more of cardioselectivity comes when you talk of dobutamine uh, as compared to dopamine, I should say. Okay? Especially the beta one. The beta one effects of uh, dobutamine are the ones which are exaggerated. So we will be talking more cardioselective because beta one receptors, you just think of heart as a primary site where they are present, okay. So uh, that is one thing about dobutamine. Uh, dobutamine uh, does not produce tachycardia with doses of around 20 microgram per kg per minute and does not rely on endogenous catecholamines to produce uh, effect. It can be used uh, in cardio and that's why it can be used in cardio, uh, catecholamine depleted states, yeah. okay. So that's also yeah. some like in uh, chronic heart failure. Chronic heart failure. So yeah. again, cardio selectivity specificity comes here. Again, tachyphylaxis uh, due to down regulation of beta receptors may occur after three days of use. Now, tachyphylaxis uh, to explain is acute tolerance. Acute tolerance, okay. So, short term, you use the drug for a short term and then suddenly uh, it may, the body becomes unresponsive to the presence of the drug. But it has to be something which is of short term use, not something which is a very long term use. Huh? So, tachyphylaxis is slightly different from tolerance. Yeah. Tolerance will come more of a lot of longer use of, of period of, but tachyphylaxis is very acute. So, uh, it's just the three days use. Um, that and if you want to use for more duration, yeah. use it intermittently. Intermittent. That's the way, yeah. because you want to prevent any kind of tolerance, you need yeah. to intermittently use that. Uh, I think we talked about that when we had a video on nitrate. So, mm -hmm. tolerance develops. So, you have to give a nitrate free period. Mm -hmm. The reason is that tolerance doesn't develop. But same appears with even dobutamine. So, we need to be aware that you use intermittent infusions if you want to use it for a longer period of time. It reduces the peripheral vascular, peripheral vascular resistance, so can be used in heart failure, especially right sided. It is less uh, I should say arrhythmogenic as compared to adrenaline. So, 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 less of arrhythmia caused by dobutamine. Again, the specificity, cardiac protectivity issues with dobutamine are much more as compared to any other sympathomimetics in general. Okay. Uh, it can be used in septic shock and dobutamine can be initiated in combinations with noradrenaline or norepinephrine in patients with marked limb dysfunction. Uh, for example, people with elevated cardiac filling pressures, low output states, uh, you can use this stuff. In low output cardiac shock, uh, of course, congestive cardiac failure or myocardial infarction, dobutamine may be initiated in combination with noradrenaline. It can also be used in pulmonary embolism and it's available as 50 milligrams uh, per 4 ml or as 250 milligrams per 20 ml ampule. That's the range it is available uh, across. So that was a very uh, short talk on dobutamine. Again, an important drug, mostly cardio selectivity, beta one action is that one needs to be uh, remembered. Anything to add? I think that's, the, that's quite a uh, yeah. short but yeah. uh, comprehensive. Comprehensive on dobutamine. Okay. Uh, the next agent, uh, again, I'm not that familiar with the use, practical use of this agent, but I think Dr. Susmita has been using it quite often. Uh, it has a role to play, of course, and it's going to be on vasopressins. So vasopressin. Right. Uh, we uh, conventionally we know vasopressin as a as something which is treated by the posterior yeah. pituitary yeah. gland, but uh, it has been used and is being used as an alternative to epinephrine. Yeah. 
Uh, in addition to the uh, so many effects on the kidneys, yeah. it is also a potent vasoconstrictor. Uh -huh. And this is because of its action on the peripheral vasopressin receptors. Yes. Uh, it has been used and is recommended by the, again, the 2010 uh, American Heart Association guidelines. Yes. It can be used as 40 units given intravenously yeah. as a single dose uh -huh. instead of either the first or second dose of epinephrine, epinephrine no. both in uh, asystole uh, patients or in pulseless electrical activity as well as in patients uh, whom shock has been given yeah. in VF but not responding. Okay. So it has been given. And it has been found, there has been a meta-analysis mm. and it has been found that it improved the long-term survival mm. in a subgroup of cardiac arrest patients okay. who presented with asystole and were treated with vasopressin. In comparison, in compared with adrenaline, right. it is coming up as an alternative, I should say, to adrenaline. Adrenaline, at least, yeah. um, uh, it is used and it is recommended, recommended. in the uh, AHA guidelines. Yeah. Yeah. And after 10 years of ongoing research, it has become a very important part of the anesthesiologist armamentarium yeah. in treatment of cardiac arrest and severe shock states. And severe shock states. Uh, particularly, it is recommended in septic shock mm -hmm. because uh, it is thought that there is an insufficiency or a deficiency of vasopressin in these septic conditions. Yeah. And therefore, 0 0.01 to 0 0.04 units per minute yeah. is recommended as infusion in patients with septic shock. Yeah. It may also be added to norepinephrine yeah. to optimize the therapeutic efficacy of uh, the drug norepinephrine. And it has also been used in children. So that is as far as, as the status of the is concerned. Okay. Uh, I think uh, we did today a lot of words. Starting with adrenaline, noradrenaline, dopamine, dobutamine, and the last is of course vasopressin. Uh, extensive knowledge I think was uh, discussed on these drugs. Um, of course, uh, it takes a lot of time to assimilate this kind of um, information and put it in words across. Uh, I should thank you, Dr. Sumir, who has been with me uh, throughout the process of making these sessions, even with the materials that we just collected and so on. I should thank her once again that she accepted this offer and has been on the show. Uh, the next session is going to be again on a few more drugs that we are going to be used in uh, emergency medicine. So do keep watching these videos uh, uh, and uh, I should say enjoy listening and learning. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.